Welcome everyone to this session where I want to spend some time thinking about alternative ways that uh, arable farmers can um, grow crops and reduce their environmental impact and at the same time cope with the changing climate that we are experiencing. So we need to develop climate smart farming systems because we have a target of net zero emissions by 2040 in the United Kingdom. And obviously we're looking to um, make that globally by 2050. And we need to have farming systems that be, can be climate resilient. So as we see changing weather patterns, our crops can cope with extreme rainfall events uh, and extreme droughts and we still end up with reliable food production. And this also takes a slight shift in the way we think about food production as we move away from production systems that are purely focused on yield. You know, farmers are talking about they wanting 10 ton a hectare of, of wheat or um, five ton a hectare of oil seed rape and thinking about how they use the resources that they are growing their crops with effectively and um, minimising the greenhouse gas emissions. And then also going on to consider the crop protection challenges and crop production challenges. So um, thinking about managing weeds, pests and diseases growing in those crops and um, making sure that we produce sufficient yield. So this is a norm for most farmers um, across the UK when they're growing the main crops we have, that they're using um, nitrogen fertilisers which have been manufactured using the um, Harbour Bosch process and um, they apply this and they get a very large yield response, hence their use of it, and that drives this yield driven farming. And just to put that into perspective, we can see the rise uh, the increased use of um, ammonia production of course in the united kingdom we also use uh, a lot of ammonium nitrate um, to um, levels that are um, very high and many people have linked this to the rise in global populations as more food has enabled more people to um, survive and live on our planet but at the Royal Agricultural University, we've been trying to think of other ways that we can farm, which reduces our reliance on the Harbour Bosch process, which is very energy intensive during the manufacturing of nitrogen fertiliser, because it requires high temperatures and natural gases as the um, part of the process, as well as um, often being very damaging when it's applied to the fields because of inefficiencies of use and the generally considered um, statistic on the efficiency of nitrogen use is only 60%. So 40% of nitrogen applied to crops in the manner previously shown is lost and much of that is through gaseous emissions in the form of um, nitrous oxide gases which are obviously a very damaging greenhouse gas far worse than carbon dioxide as well as nitrate leaching as well, which has um, environmental considerations. So by looking at clover, um, it offers the opportunity to build soil carbon. It develops a taproot. We often grow it in the ground for two years. So um, it uh, has time to build up a decent root system, which leaves residual carbon behind. It's a legume, so it's nitrogen fixing and doesn't rely on um, the Haber-Bosch process to, uh, to fuel its growth. It adds diversity into a crop rotation, um, which um, is good and can minimise some risks of crop failure. And it can also provide forage for livestock. But the reason that farmers generally don't grow clover is as an ex they see it as an expense and a time consideration in their rotation. So instead of having a heavy rotation focused on food production, where they might be growing something like wheat, barley, oilseed, rape, which is very much the standard in the United Kingdom at the moment, um, instead they have to take one or two years 
for um, nit for growing red clover in their crop rotation, and um, they don't necessarily um, get a profitable crop from it. And um, it's uh, challenges of growing it. So here are some trial work, some initial trials we did at the Royal Agricultural University, where we went back to slightly more traditional systems and looked at growing um, red clover, um, rye grass, coxfoot, which are all very normal species grown in the United Kingdom, and compared them to fallowing land and also to adding farmyard manure to plots. And um, we grew these for either one or two years in these, in these conditions, and then um, grew, um, ploughed it out and grew a crop of wheat afterwards. And when we looked at the resulting yield, first of all, I want to focus on the graph on the left. Um, we can see that all these higher bars here um, have RC under them, stands for red clover. So every time when we had red clover in the trial plots, the resulting crop yields afterwards were much higher than even where we applied farmyard manure as a fertilizer and much greater than just leaving the ground fallow, which has um, lower biodiversity value, depending on how it's recolonized. And the grasses on their own, such as coxfoot and ryegrass. And this um, became even more evident when we looked at the um, cumulative nitrogen um, from the production of these crops. And we can see again how well um, red clover performed in these scenarios. So then we wanted to take the idea of utilising red clover better. Could we um, discover traits in red clover that made it more suitable for adding fertility into uh, arable farming systems uh, that would reduce our reliance on the Harbour Bosch process? And so we looked at the types of ways that red clover grew. So was it an early or late maturing variety? And generally, there's about a 10 to 14 day difference in when these crops um, flower. And we looked at taking the more normal um, diploid 2N type um, clover varieties, which are the smaller leaves on the left, against the improved varieties of the tetraploids 4N, which have these bigger leaves um, and um, higher, generally considered to have higher dry matter production. And uh, we also compared erect growing varieties with um, flatter growing varieties. And when we grew these in plots, which is happening here, um, we tried different management techniques on these crops. And so we um, had cutting regimes here according to their flowering dates and um, then grew them either for one season or for two seasons because the persistency of the clover is another important trait. And when we um, look at uh, how these clover varieties we performed, we can see overall that the um, tetraploid varieties, so the marrow and the amos, um, were higher yielding um, in terms of dry matter production than the um, diploid varieties. Astrid was an Australian variety, a bit of a, um, it, it's, it has some of the characteristics of um, white clover in there, as in it grows stoloniferously, um, potentially, as well as producing a taproot, which is um, how red clovers grow. And it, it didn't really stand up to growth quite so well. And we can also see that this um, greater yield um, corresponded to uh, greater nitrogen kilograms per hectare um, accumulation um, and significantly more so than the um, diploid variety. So it shows a benefit of using um, enhanced plant breeding in terms of nitrogen accumulation. And uh, just to show that as well that when it came down to early and late maturing varieties, sorry, lots of data in here, but um, it was that that really wasn't so much of a feature because those that tended to be lower yielding um, in the first cut tended to then respond by being higher yielding 
in the latter cuts. So it was more important to focus on the total dry matter production. Now, um, after a year of growing the clover, uh, we destroyed the clover either chemically, um, which is um, or non-chemically, um, so no herbicide. And um, we wanted to try both those scenarios because obviously it's, it's useful to know how we get on in the absence of herbicides um, and to see how much, of, um, how much impact it has on yield. And uh, um, we can see that we grew wheat crops which reflect what farmers really uh, grow, it's our, our staple food, but we also used um, uh, mustard here as a bioassay. So um, mustard is really good at mopping up available nitrogen in the soil, so telling us how much nitrogen has been accumulated. And when we looked at wheat yields after red clover, we can see that um, where the crop had been, uh, the red clover had been destroyed by herbicide, and we had much higher yields than without herbicide because of the competition effect that it had. Whether we cut the clover once or twice made no difference on the overall yield. And actually, despite that greater nitrogen accumulation by the uh, tetraploid varieties, remember the Amos and the Maro, um, it didn't result in any um, higher uh, red, uh, any higher wheat yield. But what it did show is that we could grow um, decent crops of wheat after a crop of red clover. Now I want to move on to another vein of our research, which is um, about bicropping and again using legumes. So instead of growing sole crops of just wheat in the field, which is again our staple food, um, mixing these so that we grow them with a leguminous crop, and in this case we use beans, field beans, Vicia faba, and seeing um, how this impacts yield and response to other challenges that happen. And we do this for a range of reasons, for resource use efficiency, so light interception, weed control, reduced pests and diseases, improving soil erosion as there's less bare land, um, improving water conservation, again, more photosynthesis happening um, and uh, better cycling of water around um, and potentially yield advantages and potentially improvements in the quality of the product produced. And this has been shown by many studies, but we wanted to see how we could manipulate and improve this further for um, the growing conditions. And we also wanted to deal with some of the challenges of why farmers may not adopt bicropping. And they don't like bicropping because it makes herbicides challenging to use. And many farmers consider herbicides an essential element of their growing system because otherwise they think, how are they going to control weeds? It also poses drilling difficulties because um, you've got to get two crops into the ground. But it doesn't take um, a genius to overcome them um, either um, by, um, by modifying equipment. And many farmers are worried about the confusion at harvest, but actually these were both spring sown crops. They were both planted in um, early May, uh, early April, and um, they both came ripe together. So they were harvested together. And um, what we were looking at is other arrangements of these crops which can optimise the balance of resources so that they can become more acceptable to farmers. So we grew a row of wheat, a row of beans, a row of wheat, a row of beans, or two rows of wheat, two rows of beans, or three rows of wheat and three rows of beans, or a random broadcasting of the beans in the drilled wheat environment against a sole wheat, so just wheat, not a by crop, or against a sole beans crop on there. And this is what it looked like in the field. So this is the sole wheat growing, and this is uh, intercrop mixture. And just looking at these a bit more closely, we can see the sole beans behind here, and then the beans coming through. And then, interestingly, they, they ne the beans never did so well when they were put into the, um, uh, in a broadcast manner. But when we use these set patterns, so this is the three rows of wheat, three rows of beans. Um, you can see in the early stages that the wheat 
grows above and grows faster than the beans, it reaches maturity earlier. And then in these later stages, after the, um, the wheat has flowered, come into ear and flowered and set grain, then the beans really um, went through stem extension, thereby utilizing um, different um, time scales and light within the um, growing environment. And um, I just want you to notice on this, this is a sole cropped beans and the weed levels in the bottom in comparison to the um, by cropping. And I'll come back to uh, well, here it is. And we can see that when we measured this, so um, this is 56 days after sowing and this is 87 days after sowing, that the by cropping um, plots had much lower um, incidence of weeds, uh, both in numbers, but predominantly in grams, so the size of the weeds in the plot. And that um, carried on through as the crops grew. And we saw that again in the second year of these experiments. And to put that into practice of what it looked like in the field, you can see these much smaller weeds, for example, in the um, by cropping in comparison to large weeds that developed in the sole cropping, particularly in the bean plots. And another interesting observation from this study was um, the um, colour of the sole wheat, which we grew all of these in the absence of synthetic nitrogen. And you can see it's quite light in colour. It's obviously not um, got a particularly high chlorophyll measure. And we measured the chlorophyll content and we found that in the by crops, so the maroon coloured bars here, we had much higher chlorophyll concentrations than in the sole crops, um, showing that there's probably some sharing of the um, symbiotically, the rhizobium generated um, nitrogen. And um, also that lack of um, intense competition between um, the wheat plants, because they're more um, spaced out, um, improved the um, chlorophyll concentrations by reducing plant to plant competition. And again, a busy table, um, but what I want to show here is the thing called the land um, efficiency ratio. And this looks at the yield of the sole crops um, versus the by crops. And basically, if the number is greater than one, it shows that the um, yield was greater than if we'd just grown sole wheat or sole beans. So we can see the sole crop here of, um, of uh, beans um, is, or of either crop is one. But when we grew wheat, we got nearly the same yield as we got when we just grew wheat. And, but we got the added bonus of having the beans in here, meaning that the land equivalent ratio um, is 1.36 or 1.37, which was significantly greater than the sole crop of only one. And we found that very markably in 2015, slightly poorer growing conditions in 2016, slightly later start. But again, we found a 16% improvement in yield. Um, so we can see here, and this also allows that if we had a really bad year because of an early drought for wheat, and then we had um, to conditions coming in later, potentially the beans have the opportunity to compensate for the poor growth of the wheat and to yield well, or vice versa, if we had a, um, good early condi growing conditions, the wheat can get away and flourish. And if it came later, very dry or very wet and dull, so it's poor photosynthetic conditions, then um, the uh, beans would be lower yielding. But overall, a higher um, land use efficiency. And just looking here at different by cropping options that there are around, um, we can potentially have lupins and lupins and wheat or lupins and triticale we've grown before here. Um, uh, growing um, oats and peas or barley and peas. This is a tropical example of growing maize and cowpea. But there's lots of maize and climbing bean options 
or even the option of growing two cereal mixtures together. So here we've got oats and barley grown together because they are utilizing um, light and nutrients at slightly different times and with different canopy structures so they can um, utilize resources more effectively. And just to put that in context, as we go forward and we're obviously always working towards the sustainable development goals and we see um, rises in um, the global population that we've experienced over um, the uh, recently, we need to develop solutions that are not only climate smart so they can cope with changing environments, but also are not going to emit so much uh, so many greenhouse gases, but still reliably and sustainably produce food. So thank you very much. And um, please let me have uh, any questions from you. Um, I'll be going over from this session um, into the uh, World Agricultural um, University's room as well for questions. So, um, uh, just looking at the questions, Dan, sorry, I couldn't look at it whilst going on. Um, okay, I'm going to um, go across to the Royal Agricultural University room. Um, I've got one question here. What format of soil nitrogen did you measure? Um, total nitrogen or nitrate nitrogen or ammonium nitrogen? We um, measured nitrate nitrogen and ammonium nitrogen. Um, I'd need to go back to the paper just to check what it was um, that I actually just presented in there. Total nitrogen is obviously um, very not, not so useful for agriculture because we don't know how it's going to be um, available. OK, so thank you very much for listening and please join us in the Royal Agricultural University room. <laughs>